Okay, so thank you for joining us. This is Ask the HR Experts, and we have two wonderful experts with us, Paula Humber and Rita Craig, and they are members of HRPBC and are co-sponsoring this event with us. Thank you, ladies. And I see some of the changes I made did not take here. So I am going to go ahead and turn this over to Karen Roberts, who is also a member of HRPBC and a board member of the um, Encore Palm Beach County. And she will take it away and introduce the lovely ladies. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Good morning and thank you, Christine. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. We're very excited to have uh, two experts with us today. And uh, first I'll introduce again, Paula Humber. Paula has a company which she founded. It's called P&L Corporate Solutions. We also have Rita Craig with us also a businesswoman and the founder of her own company, Top Tier Leadership. Uh, both of these ladies are very active in many uh, arenas, particularly in the HR Association of Palm Beach County and many other things too numerous to mention today or we would take the whole uh, webinar to speak about all of their accomplishments. Um, but they're here to give us their expertise today on some questions that we think you might be asking we have uh, incorporated some questions from the audience as well that came in in advance. And then we'll be taking some questions that come in through the chat as well. So we would like to start by saying we do have a bit of a disclaimer here. Um, our experts are here to share their opinion. This is not legal advice. They're not recommending any specific course of action, um, but we thank, you, uh, thank them again for their expertise today. So our first question is, and what we'll do is ask each person if they would like to give their opinion or start with one, and then if there's anything the other person would like to add, and then we'll rotate and um, go back and forth that way. So one of the questions, as a mature worker, I'm at an interview, how do I best answer the following types of questions? And you can see them here on your screen. And I'd like to go ahead and start with Rita. Rita, how would you like to give us some advice on some of these questions we may be facing in an interview? Where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? Um, if I find a job I like, I'd like to stay with it. Um, if not, I guess look for something more. Uh, how would you handle? To someone Rita, Rita Hacker, you are a wonderful participant, and we're going to encourage <laughs> participants to share in a little bit. Um, but what we'd like to start, if you don't mind, is with Rita. Oh, you meant the other Rita. <laughs> That's okay. We have lots of experts on this call, so it's easy to get confused. Not a problem. You're an well, expert, too, Rita Hacker. Rita Craig, you, would you like to try? Thank you, Rita Hacker. I sure will, and I usually there aren't to Rita, so it's nice to meet another Rita. But here's what I would do. Um, first and foremost, um, over the years, seeing people interviewed, prepping them for interviews and so on, I find that you have to make sure you have your headset on right. So um, a lot of it's about attitude. But when you're asked about what do you wanna do in five to 10 years, I always like to start with the why. Why might they be asking that question? Um, maybe some of you read Simon Sinek's book or saw his TED talk on starting with why. So when you think about an employer asking, you know, where do you want to be in five years? They want to really see if you're just trying to get your foot in the door or if you really have a passion for that type of job and or are you going to stay for a while or is it you're just doing something for a couple of months while you transition and go and do what you really want to do. So. I, what I would do in answering that, I'd probably chunk it and say something like, you know, for the first two years, I'd want to go in there, learn as much as I can, and um, very quickly take the kinds of skills that I've had in my background and capitalize on them so that I can best serve the clients, internal and external clients. And, and then I'd probably say something like, and then... Moving forward to that, I see myself 
exponentially learning, growing, and providing input so that I am in five years recognized as somebody who's a subject matter expert and somebody who's working collaboratively in the organization to create even more success for them. So I'd probably say something like that um, in terms of the five to 10 year question. Thank you, Rita Craig. Uh, Paula, would you care to add anything to that particular one? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, so in my experience with interviews, this question oftentimes gets you stuck for 15 minutes listening to a lot that may not need to be gone into, or it kind of stumps people and they're like, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I really don't know where I want to see myself in five years. So my advice for this type of question, as with all interviews questions is to stay on, on topic. And the topic of at hand is the job itself, the position itself. So when you're answering that question, think about the job, what's a natural succession for that job. Like Rita was talking about, you want to become a subject matter expert ultimately and looked at as someone with value to that organization. So when you, thinking about answering that question, think about the career path, think about the job at hand and stay on topic and, and, and give enough information so you answer the question completely, but not necessarily too much. So you're veering off into a world of in five to 10 years, I'd like to sail the ocean blue. <laughs> so um, that's my advice. If I can add to it, Karen, I think one of the things that employers are looking for too, and this has happened, I've had it happen to me is people say, well, in five years from now, I'd really like to have my own business. Or in five years from now, I'd like to have your job. Or five years from now, you know, I want to be, like she said, sailing the ocean. And if they feel like it's not going to work, we don't have that opportunity. It's very expensive, as you all know, to interview and train talent. So they really want to get a sense for, is there a good fit? You know, do you see yourself here in this organization? And so I, again, start with why they might be asking the question and come up with and expect this particular question to come up. Thank you. I also think too that a mature worker may wonder um, if they think, well, my goodness, why spend the money on me because I'm going to be retiring? Or, you know, do they think that is the kind of a question that folks may have, um, that how they're invested for as long as they're there, which a person could be 25 and be invested as long as they're there, but it might only be five years. So I think that was perhaps where the questioner may have been coming from in terms of being a more mature worker. So but I like the fact, as you ladies have answered, focus on becoming a subject matter expert and also becoming a, um, a person of value and focusing on the job at hand. So thank you for that answer. Okay, if we are asked at an interview, how would we feel about reporting to someone significantly younger? Paula, let's start with you. How would you help us frame an answer for that? Well, in framing an answer for that, um... And I think we also just need to take a step back and, and think about some of the questions that, that are asked. Now, um, that can be looked at as illegal or discriminatory in, in a sense. And so when you are in an interview, if you're ever in that uncomfortable situation where you're thinking, I'm asked this question, but this doesn't sound right, or this, this is uncomfortable for me, um, I feel as though I, you know, I'm not sure what to do. Um, I just want to preface my answer by saying there are three ways that you can kind of approach questions like those. So first things first, you can't, you can choose to answer it. It's your choice. You know, maybe you think the person asked it naively, they didn't think about it. They were just really trying to get to know me. Maybe we built rapport. And so, Hey, it's no big deal. I'm going to, I'm going to just answer this question. Um, you could sidestep and that takes a little bit of tact, um, where you kind of discreetly refuse to answer the question, but you address exactly the concern that they raised. So in this particular instance, it was, you know, how would you handle reporting to a boss who's significantly younger? Um, at the end of it, they're wanting to know what management style that you work best with. So you can skip the skip all of the other 
politics behind it and answer that question. Um, or you can, you can ask a question and, well, I, I'm not quite sure. I don't quite understand, um, you know, the, 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 the purpose for the question. Can you, can you, can, can you explain to me a little bit more um, why, or not why you're answering the, asking the question, but what the question is all about. And maybe they'll rephrase it in a different way that'll make it easier for you to answer. This one in particular, though, I would talk about the management style that you um, have worked best with. Um, I would talk about an experience with a best manager um, and, and say, hey, I've, I worked best with this manager because um, they were one that gave a lot of feedback to me. And they, we had weekly talks and we reviewed everything we went through and I think that answers the question without necessarily, with taking out that almost negative connotation of, well, you're reporting to someone who's significantly younger than you, ha, 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 you know, you're, you're answering their question. Thank you. That is very good, um, a good way to answer how you work best, or you could even say that you're someone who is adaptable to any style. So I like how you helped us focus on um, the, the age of the person is not relevant. Again, it's exactly. focused on you as the applicant and how you, you know, bring yourself to work every day and are eager to work with others. Rita Craig, anything you'd like to share on that one that has not been discussed? I think if I was asked that, I would just say age is not a determining factor on uh, whether or not I work well with someone or not. You know, I've, I've been, I've, I would probably say that I've had the opportunity throughout my career to work with a diverse group of people, whether it's race, age, and so on, and that's not a determining factor. I go and work for a company, and I'm in, I am, am inspired by a leader who does blank, 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 and none of those blank, blank, blanks would have anything to do with age. It would be about their credibility, their ethics, their integrity, um, and, and their their knowledge that would be, would inspire me. And that's what I look for in a leader. Thank you, ladies. These are very helpful tips. The next question we might get in an interview is asking how we have kept up with technology or, or how comfortable are we with technology? Questions of that nature. Please give us some advice on that one. And we'll start with Rita Craig. <laughs> So I think a lot of it depends upon the job that you're applying for. Right now, the, you know, we live in an environment where continuous improvement is where it's at. So even people who are in the work environment of whatever age must continually upgrade their skills. Everybody's been talking about it for years. So you, know, you have to look at yourself as a job applicant. What are you doing? And let's say you're applying for a job in the healthcare field. You should know the latest technology and perhaps you can get online and have some free courses or tap into career source or some of the other local organizations that maybe even be able to offset the the cost of those kinds of things so i would say there are some fundamental technology social media things like that that people are expected to to know and further i would look at the job description and look and look and see in the job description if it's required but I think that it's incumbent upon the individual to understand the job, know the job they're applying for, know the kind of technology that's out there, seek experts and friends who might work in that field and get aware of it so you can at least say, I haven't had the opportunity to get in-depth training on, but I'm aware of these kinds of things. But furthermore, these are the, these are the technologies that I'm familiar with, and maybe you've taken online courses or I've had some experience in your past that you, you can share. But I think every single day I know personally, I get up, I look at five resources to continuously study leadership and talent. And I think that's one of the things you have to show is that you're hungry and you're curious because unfortunately some people make the assumption because of your chronological age that maybe you're not as up to date as other. And that's so false. So I think whatever you can do to show that you are curious, hungry, and um, know, in fact, about some of the technologies and use them, that would be helpful. Very good. Thank you, Rita. Paula? I, I was going to piggyback exactly what Rita had to say. Um, we always focus back on the job. 
focus on the job at hand and the job description and be familiar with what is required for the job and speak to those things. You should have some familiarity with those things in the job description. Um, but if you don't, like Rita mentioned, um, there are a lot of resources out there. There is um, the library. There's a lot of how-to books. Um, there is YouTube University. <laughs> where I learned most of how to anything from how to hang a picture in the bathroom to you know fix patch up a, a wall uh, you know you can learn anything on YouTube um, so depending on what it is um, you can try to self-educate um, and then always uh, again just always be familiar with the job description I think that's that's the most important thing tailor all the questions back to that that's what's most important I'd like to add something too. There's something called MOOS, in case the um, participants haven't heard of MOOS, which is Massive Open Online Courses. Um, there's like Khan Academy, there's Ode Odemi. Um, you can get online and for no cost, you could take courses at MIT, Harvard, Stanford, you name it. So I would suggest that you do a search for massive open online courses and see what courses are available for you to learn. Uh, again, I mentioned Career Source. They have, I believe, technology courses that they provide as well uh, at no cost. So look into local resources that might be available as well. Thank you, Aunt Rita. And that, I know Holly Fry is on the call, I believe, and perhaps at the end she can share. Um, because of the fact that she works at Career Source, so perhaps Holly, at the end, when we have a few moments, you can speak to what local resources um, Career Source would have in terms of specifically the state-of-the-art technology and professional training. So thank you for that, um, ladies. The last question on this one is: If we're asked mm -hmm. about our amount of energy and motivation at this stage or state in our career, I believe that should have read stage. Um, how would we best speak to that? Uh, we've heard about focusing on the job. Uh, what else, Paula, would you like to add for that question, please? Okay, in addition to focusing on the job, we're again focusing on what is required of us. Um, maybe, maybe we could talk to the physical demands in the job description for this one. Um, and then we, we want to talk about your ability to meet those demands. Um, you can also then talk about what motivates you. And I think that's what I would um, dominate the, the, my answer with. So I, I am motivated by meeting deadlines. I love working with the team. I, I, you know, I love um, having a, 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 a problem and finding a great solution for it. So I think I would dominate my answer with what does motivate me while also keeping with the job description and what's required of the position. Thank you, Paula. That gives you a chance to do um, the, the applicant, whoever it is, to do a little bragging about themselves, right? And showing some additional advantages. So thank you for that tip. Rita Craig? Yeah, I think it's about how you show up. So um, to add what she said, she's spot on. Uh, the other angle is, you know, if they're asking you about your energy and motivation, or if you're coming in there and you're late and you're being very monotone and you don't look like you have any energy, someone might make the assumption that you don't have the energy and motivation. So I think one of the best things you can do is demonstrate that you do have the energy and motivation. So that question would never even come up. Uh, so, you know, it's all about your brand. You know, I, I tell people all the time throughout the years, you know, I, I get these job applications and people send them to me and they're, you know, mirrored with errors and, you know, grammar problems and so on. I say, you know, I don't even finish reading them. I throw them in the garbage because if you're, if you're not going to be your own walking brand, why should I pay attention to you? So I think that question should never come up personally if, if you're demonstrating energy and motivation. So that would be my point on that question. Okay, we'll hope to never see that one in, in a <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Christine, our next slide, please. 
Okay, we've talked about this a bit. What is the best way to demonstrate value and experience to a prospective employer? It was touched on a bit in the other questions, but I'd like to turn it over to our two panelists to see if they have anything to add uh, on that question, please. You got it, go ahead, go first. <laughs> you want me to go first? You can. So one of the best ways I think to demonstrate value and experience would be, you know, do your homework. First of all, I think it goes, you know, uh, before the interview, during the interview and after the interview. And I'll give you a perfect example. Years ago, my son was going for a, a job interview and it was for the Wade Hampton Golf Club in the Carolinas. And on the way up there, I said to him, you know, do you know who Wade Hampton is? And he goes, I have no idea. I said, okay, if I asked you that question in the interview and you couldn't answer me, I'd be so ending that interview. And I said, you better get online and understand who this gentleman was that this course was named after. And sure enough, in the interview, that was asked and he ended up with a two hour interview and a job offer. And the gentleman told him, I always ask that question. If people don't uh, know the answer, I usually you know, cut the interview short. So I think that you, you can show value and experience by being prepared, that you've done your homework before you've gotten there, that you, you have, um, you're curious, that you have respect for the company, you know the latest news, um, that you're able to tie what's going on with the company with your expertise and your experience. And, and able to communicate to that person um, the value. Another thing you could do to demonstrate value is have somebody refer you to that company. I mean, you might be coming there unknown. And as somebody who used to have people come to me all the time when I worked in corporate and still today when I do placements, is I love it when somebody tells me, you know, I've got this friend of mine or a business associate that's really good. Would you, would you talk to that person? So right away, they've got value to me because somebody else already recommended them rather than coming to me cold. So um, the experience, I think, if you can show and tie it to the company's mission and some of their key challenges and some of the latest news on their website, which of course, I'm assuming that you look at all that, then I think that's how you can do it. Wonderful, Rita, thank you for that, Paula. Well, I had a little bit of a different take on this question. I want to bring you into a trend, if you will, on the other side. So when I'm training recruiters or our managers to do interviews, we talk about this trend of behavioral interviewing questions. And so that's how your questions will generally be phased. So the, the premise of behavioral interviewing is that um, your past performance will indicate how you'll perform on the job in the future. And so you get questions that are more open or ended. So for this question, you, you, you may be asked, tell me about a time when you demonstrated value um, to your perspective, to your employer. And so they're looking for you to do just that. And so in this point, as the employee or the interviewee, you would um, do your best to utilize what they call storytelling skills. And the, with their storytelling skills, you have plenty, you should at this point in your careers have plenty of experiences to draw inferences of and, and times when this happened or times when that happened. And you can use it as in your advantage. Um, a lot of times when I talk to people who are going up for a job, they're like, but what if I don't have the experience or what, what, I don't know what to say. Um, utilize the experiences that you, that you have, the breadth of knowledge, the relationships that you have to answer questions like these with great stories and, you know, add humor in there and just be memorable when it comes to, to things like that. And you'll, you'll definitely be able to um, show that you are uh, adding knowledge and, and value. Sorry, trying to read the note down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much because I do like both of the answers that you've shared in terms, uh, ladies, in terms of uh, storytelling, in terms of being relevant, being curious, knowing what's going on in the world today and relate your experiences uh, and specifically also if you can get a reference or a referral to that organization. So I think that many of the things you've shared have really 
given us an answer to the next question, but mm -hmm. is there anything else that you can think of that we haven't discussed helping a candidate stand out? We all know today um, there's going to be lots of folks applying. Uh, anything else other than the wonderful tips you've shared that might be uh, helpful to get a leg up, so to speak? And I'll start with Rita Craig. Yes, I think the uh, I, because we're living virtually today, I think getting comfortable with using technology like Zoom. I've used this for four years, so I feel very comfortable with it. But I'm amazed at how many people aren't. And if you're going to be getting interviewed via some kind of remote system, you have to really feel comfortable doing it. So I'm staring right at the count, the computer um, little green dot. So I'm looking right at you in the eye. But a lot of times that people are talking like this because they're looking at all the wonderful people. There's Paula, there's Karen, there's Rita, there's Christine, and I see all you down here. So if I'm in a job interview and I'm talking like this, I'm not gonna be very successful. Further, most people are like this, or they're down like this, or I had a call yesterday with a, a client, I called her, actually called her this morning and said, let me give you a tip, make sure you're eye level to the camera because if not, I'm looking up your neck and up your nose, or you're too dark, or if there's phones ringing in the background, or whatever it happens to be. You need to learn and practice with your friends. We talked a little bit before about, I have a virtual background right now on. Obviously I can, whoops, hold on. I could take my virtual background off, and this is what my background would look like because I have a green screen on right behind me. But behind that are my blinds and the lights coming in from the back and you can't have light in the back. But I wouldn't go for a job interview and having a heart in the sky or pretend like I'm at the beach or whatever unless I'm becoming a lifeguard. So I think you have to be very careful about these kinds of things now that, let me put this back, now that you're trying to show a professional look Get a buddy, learn how to talk to that camera, learn how to feel comfortable. There might be documents, which we could show documents on this with share screen, which I will do later. But uh, learn, learn how to use this and navigate this. I've had people in the middle of conversations or dogs jumping on them and all kinds of things. All of that is going to make an impact to the interviewer. So just be careful. Thank you, Rita. How about Paula? Anything you'd like to add about helping a candidate stand out? Yes. So in my opinion, an interview always starts at the point when I see your resume. And so my biggest advice is to make sure that piece of paper, if you will, that's your, that, that doesn't get you kicked out <laughs> before I even have you sit in front of my face. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to give a couple of resume tips. Um, especially for people who have worked uh, for a long time. Um, number one, try, try, try to minimize it as much as possible and keep it to at least two pages, one page preferably. But if I'm a recruiter and I've got a, a whole bunch of emails, either a stack or I have to go on electronically and take a look, the ones that tend to go on and on and on, I look at the first page and I might look at the last. Everything in between, honestly, I don't, I don't have the time or, or the energy to, to sit and thumb through all of them. So give me the, mo the meatiest information, what you want me to know in that first page and or keep it to page one and page two, and that's it. Try to tailor your resume to the position itself. Take a look at that position and those positions that are relevant. You know, maybe the, the specific tasks that they talk about in the job description, include those tasks and highlight those tasks in your description of the job. And I think that will give you a leg up um, before you even get before someone in order to get before someone in the first place, because a lot is judged based upon that piece of paper, believe it or not. Karen, I'd like to add too. I want to go back to what I said. I give you a thumbs up there, Paula. I agree with you. It's, um, and for all of you not familiar with zoom, all that is, is the reaction button. So, um, and you can change the skin color. It's great. The, um, the interview, the whole applying for candidates and so on, before, during, and after. That's what you have to think about. What can you do before, like Paula said, um, 
whoever you meet, the front line person, that front reception is probably the most powerful person in the interview process. You got to be so nice, show up early, that kind of thing. Um, know you, do your homework, bring a portfolio with, with uh, information about the company. So before, during, and then after, follow up with a nice thank you note. Drop it off. I've told clients, drop it off with a bag of tea or a box of tea saying, you know what, you hire me, you can sit back, have tea, know your job will be taken care of, or bring, you know, a box of chocolates and say, be sweet to work here, thanks, it was a treat meeting you, whatever. Come up with something that makes you stand out because there are so many people, especially if it's a marketing and sales kind of job, show them that you're all about marketing and sales. So don't ever miss the opportunity. Also, if you miss something in the interview or wish you had said something, because I think Paulo attests to this, we all have the, the preparation we do and then we execute on that interview and then we walk away, oh, I wish I could have would have said it blank, right? There's always the speech you prepare for, the, peach, the speech you deliver and the speech you wish you had. Yeah. So use that thank you note to say, you know, I was reflecting on one of your questions and I wanted to elaborate a little more. And then in that thank you note, give them a few more bits of information about you that are great nuggets that might help you land the job. One more thing, um, and it's irrelevant to the resume as well as what Rita was saying. Sometimes you just want to say in that objective, say what you mean, what you intend. Um, mm -hmm. I think that part of this question also you know, being overqualified is the fact that you've been a manager of people, you've managed people, you've gone so high and now this position is a support position. But if it's your intention to now utilize your, your skills that you learned as a manager to, to help someone else, you know, develop on the other side, you know, then put that in your objective up top there at your resume. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. And I know, Paula, that is a question coming up a bit later as well. So perhaps we'll delve into that a bit more if a person is wanting to um, have a different type of a position going forward than perhaps they had in the past. But thank you for that. Okay, Christine, I guess we're ready to move on to our next slide, please. <laughs> Aha, when Paula, here it is. You were just referring to that. Uh, the dreaded overqualified label. Many times um, uh, along a career path, a person uh, is very happy to take a position that perhaps the employer might think, oh, wow, they've been a manager before. Um, how come they're applying for this position? Uh, what would you say, anything else, Rita, in addition to perhaps what Paula shared, and then we'll give her another opportunity to really convey to the hiring manager in that company that this is indeed the position you're looking for and you're very happy and qualified for that. So how would you advise us? I think I'd probably start out by complimenting them for saying I was overqualified. So um, thank you for thinking that I'm overqualified. I choose to say that I am solidly qualified for your position. So I appreciate that based upon my, my past expertise. And then I'd probably be very honest. You know, I've reached a point in my career where I've, I've been able to achieve a certain level of success. And I've, I'm shifting to the point where I don't, maybe I, I, I don't um, uh, want as much responsibility as I had at that higher level. And so this is the kind of job that is really right in my wheelhouse. And I want to, um, uh, obtain moving forward where my, my life, my life journey has changed. And this is the level that, that I'm interested in. I think you just be honest about it. But um, I, I, I think I would first again, thank them for saying I was overqualified. And then I'd go on to exp express how I can use my past expertise to do that job and hopefully in a short time help mentor other people. And that that's what would give you happiness as well to not only walk in there doing the job that you can do feeling so confident that you can hit the street running but also help others bring their skills up to date if there's that need in the organization i totally agree in addition to what i said and what you said you're shifting from you know what you you getting to a level of success to doing something that now I love. I'm shifting to something that now I'm at the point in my life where I can do something that I love to do. And, and this part of the process is what I love. So be honest, I agree. 
Paul, I have a friend who does a speech call from success to significance. And that's uh -huh. how he summarizes exactly what you just said. Oh, okay. Wonderful. <laughs> and I know that we all know that one of the advantages of hiring mature workers, as was just stated, is the importance and the opportunity and the ability for that mature worker to be a mentor. I mean, that is such a wonderful way to bring intergenerational um, opportunities because there are many uh, younger career people looking and they want to know a little bit more about how to succeed or what have you experienced. So uh, bringing forth the fact that you love mentoring and that's something you're looking to do is really in the employer's benefit if they really understand you know, the value of that for mature workers. So thank you for bringing that up about the opportunity to mentor. Okay, our next question, please. All right, here's an, one a person may say, aha, I really had time to think during this um, wonderful time at home and isolation and uh, thinking about things and what we want to do with the rest of our lives. What if we want to make a career change? And particularly with what's going on in the economy right now, uh, ladies, what would you do? What would you tell us to do? Is, are we crazy or should we go for it? And we'll start with Rita Craig. Well, I, I um, you know, the older I get, I think 50 so young, but <laughs> I probably would say um, is it's not crazy whatsoever. And I do a little research on some of the people who are very well known, who have made life changes and learned how to paint later. I uh, can't think of the artist, oh, that does the out west, very, uh, what's her name? Does that great art? Oh, it'll come to me. Anyway, I would come up with some people who shifted late and say, wow, look at the beauty of what some of these individuals did. And within my experience and where I worked in corporate, I shifted gears a lot. Same company, but changed. So it wasn't just in 50s and 60s. I've done that my whole life. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. So I would say that um, I, I think that changing careers is appropriate. The, our lives have changed tremendously. Personal lives have changed. Externally, things have changed. So I would say I'm one of those individuals who's very curious and one of those individuals who likes to look at the next best thing and one of those individuals who... Um, wants to be involved and maintain the energy and excitement about the changing environment in which we live and want to be part of the architect to, to make it happen. So I don't think it's change, I don't think it's crazy at all. Whatever gives you passion, I think it all goes to whatever age you are. Um, as long as you have passion for something, you might have seen, uh, I've had friends say, oh, I worked at HR my whole life, I want to do something different. Or I have a sister who, worked in uh, corporate her whole life. And then all of a sudden she said, you know, I think that real estate stuff looks pretty interesting. And now she's a top realtor, having never worked in real estate before, but she took her skills from corporate and all that she learned there and is just nailing it in, in the private sector as a, a top real estate agent. So I think you inventory your competencies, your be real about your passions, put those two together and look at the opportunities that you have out there, whatever age, to take what you love, take what you know, and build a life that you, you know, never want to take a vacation from. That's awesome. You said it great, but I, I say the same thing. Go for it. Go for it. It is no longer the trend for people to stay at companies for years and years and years. It's commendable. People do value loyalty, but it just isn't the trend. You don't see people's resumes um, that, where they stay um, for, for 20 some odd years. That's a really long time. As to when you know, I was first starting in corporate America, that was kind of the expectation. You know, you stay with the company for a certain amount of time or you stay with the, stick with the field for a certain amount of time. So I would go for it. I think the, the world also just, just is um, conducive for things like that as well. Take a look at all the educational programs out there. They're designed for adult learners. They're designed for people who are maybe on their second stage learning. Um, on the side or learning on the weekend or learning on the computer, learning when they have time in order to learn a new skill. So I, I agree. I think it's grab it by the horns, do what you're passionate about. 
Thank you, ladies. That is very uplifting for those folks who might be thinking about uh, a bit of a change and inventorying skills and, and marrying that with passion. So thank you very much. Christine, our next slide, please. Okay, I don't know if we have, uh, perhaps is there any other thoughts you can share on this? This was a question that someone might be having trouble finding full-time work. I think that was the intent here that perhaps maybe they had been a bit more successful being offered part-time, but they were really looking for something with benefits. So would there be anything specific that we haven't discussed, ladies, that you might like to share? And we'll start with Rita Craig. Well, I would say make sure you tell everybody in the universe you're looking for a job. Um, whether you walk into Publix or family member, friends, neighbors, social media contacts, let everybody know because usually you find a job through a friend or some other you know, relationship. And um, just as they teach you an outplacement, you don't wanna put your friends in an awkward position like, hey, do you wanna hire me or whatever. But I would suggest that one, you let everybody know you're looking for a job, but I would phrase it this way. You know, I'm looking for a job. You understand my background, my experience. Could you think of three individuals that I might speak to or three companies that I might contact that might have a position that is conducive to my background and my, my career goals? And um, if they say yes, they say, may I use your name when I call, if they give you a particular person. And then every time you talk to somebody, you say, can you give me three names? Can you give me three names? The next thing you know, you've got a laundry list of people to contact. Or here's what happens. If you say to the person, do you have a name of a person I could speak to? And they say, wait a second, I'll hire you. Then you salvage that relationship. They know you're working. They know you, or excuse me, they know you're looking for a job, but you're not putting that relationship, your friend relationship in an awkward position. It opens that door for them to say, yes, I would like to hire you or explore that possibility and or for them to refer you to somebody else. Um, what I would say to that, to that question um, would be first to take a look at why you need a full-time job. Most, most of the times before this, I would think people thought I need a full-time job for uh, in order to make a certain amount of money, or, you know, I, I want to be out of the house from nine to five. There, there are reasons why we want certain things in a job, but I will encourage you to think about a job as the total package. When you have a full-time job, there are benefits that you need. So uh, perhaps you're, you're tied on a certain salary amount that you, you want to make but you have this full-time job that doesn't quite make that much money. But what's the benefit to being there? Um, is there a altruistic benefit? Um, are there perks, benefits that you would have for, for example, health insurance or, or vision or dental? Um, take a look at the total package and not just um, full-time, like the hours, 40 hours, and I, sh I need to make this amount of money. Open, the, open your perspective when you're thinking about um, the type of position you need and be open to a part-time position that may, that may be something that you can handle at this point and you might not have thought of that before. Thank you very much, ladies. Christine, let's uh, advance our slides, please. Okay. Uh, one of the things about Encore Palm Beach County is we are supporting mature workers, whether they're looking for other paid employment, looking to start their own business and be an entrepreneur, and also volunteering. So uh, volunteering is very important to many of us. And so would volunteering be a good way to demonstrate our value to a prospective employer? Ladies, we'll start with uh, Paula this time. Thanks. Um, I think that this, the world, we're all moving to a more socially consciousness, if you will, even on a corporate level. And some organizations you'll find have causes that they are more attuned to. And so, especially if your volunteerism is tied to those, I say, heck yeah, let them know that that's something that you're involved in. That's something that you're passionate about. Um, 
uh, one thing that's logistical about your resume, say you have been volunteering for a number of years at an organization, you can put that on your resume as a experience or position. But the two things is one, make sure you have someone at that organization who can verify your background and whenever they do a background check. So it's not like you made this up or it looks like you made it up. And then you would outline just like you would in a, in a regular job, the things within that volunteer position that lend themselves as value to the position that you're interviewing to. I would, I would just do those things, but definitely I wouldn't shy away from volunteerism. I would use it to my advantage. Thank you, Rita Craig. Would you like to add to that? Uh, I, don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Paul is spot on. I mean, volunteer, it's a great way, especially um, if you have a gap in employment. Um, you know, sometimes people discount work that's not paid work. And you're learning things, you're adding value, you're in leadership roles, whether you're uh, somebody who's doing something at a school or somebody who's working for the Heart Association, whatever. Absolutely, she's spot on. If you look at a lot of large corporations that have social responsibility sites or sections on their websites now, because there is such a focus on that. So absolutely, absolutely think about it. And it's good for the soul. Yes, good for the soul, you're right. Wonderful. Okay, Christine, our next slide, please. And Christine, I haven't looked at my watch this whole time because this has been fascinating and our answers of our experts has been so wonderful. I'm looking at my watch only to see how are we doing on time, Christine? I'm not sure how many more questions we have. We have about three more questions in about 10 minutes. Okay. So we'll just, we're getting close. We're getting close, but we're, we're covering such wonderful material. Great information, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, another question we have is again, uh, uh, being an entrepreneur or wanting to start one's own business is also an excellent opportunity. And is there a way to your knowledge that someone may register with the state of Florida to become a preferred vendor? Or perhaps even locally, um, maybe someone would can be qualified for a woman or minority owned business. Anything you ladies would like to share about how one might begin looking into that? And I'll start with Paula. All right. Um, the way that you start with those processes is, first of all, um, with, with the registration process, the way that you register your business, um, if you're trying to designate yourself as a woman-owned business or a minority-owned business or a veteran-owned business, you need to own at least 51% of the company. Um, and in, in owning 51% of the company, you have to have some type of documentation that, that shows that. Um, from there, you need a Dunn's number and then a Sam's number. Um, but from at that point, the SBA.org SBA is a great a resource for answering those questions. Um, I would, they are, there are a plethora of trainings, um, just uh, checklists and, and things to do at that point. And so you can establish yourself on a national level. Um, I, I, my business is a woman owned business. And so we are certified through the SBA and they have third party providers who can certify you. But I just got an email yesterday that as of, I think, July 15th, um, they're offering that service for free. So if this is a great time, if you're thinking about going in that direction, because generally it's um, somewhere upwards $300, $400 in order to register your business. But if you, if you do that, take advantage of that after, I think, the 15th of July, take a look at sba.org again. Um, it a, would be a great time to take advantage of that. Then on the local level and for Florida, um, there isn't a way not necessarily to, to uh, register yourself, but there is the Florida Office of Supplier Diversity. You can get a cert certification through them as well. Locally, um, 
there are plenty of ways to do business with the government. So in Palm Beach County, we, we have Palm Beach County government. We have the school board of Broward County, I mean, Palm Beach County, sorry. We have um, Solid Waste Authority. Um, there's plenty of local vendors that have certification programs, and then they have a plethora of events that t teach you how to do business as a prime or a subcontractor. And they even have, sorry to talk so much about this. <laughs> you, my, you guys found my passion, right? <laughs> they even have um, um, rules in place where there's a percentage of every bid that goes on that goes out that needs to go towards businesses that are women owned or minority owned or veteran owned. So they're trying and making an effort in order to include those businesses in, in their strategy. I'm done. <laughs> well, thank you, Paula. And we certainly can see, um, as you stated, it was a passion and that's, that really came through. And thank you for uh, your expertise in this. And Ms. Rita Craig, I know you have know a thing or two about um, this starting a business and being registered. So what would you like to share, please? I, I think you asked the right person the question. Paula covered <laughs> I think everything. One thing I will say is if you do already have a business and you're having a tough time, um, there's the Business Development Board, um, bizhelppbc.com. I sit on two of their committees on re-energizing the, the county on tourism and, um, and other aspects. So look at that website, there's model programs on how to reopen from the Breakers and the Marianne and Singer Island. There's all kinds of resources, the Small Business Administration and so on. So um, I, think, I think she covered that more than enough. It was wonderful. <laughs> she has passion. That's the kind of passion, if, she, if you're like that when you go in for a job interview, you won't get that um, energy question that we talked about. <laughs> I'm not overqualified. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I love how all of this is all coming together as we're wrapping up close to our hour here. Christine, take it away, please, to our next question. Okay, we did talk a bit about the continued curiosity, continued passion, continued learning, um, and all the different ways that one can stay uh, up on different things and take advantage of the free resources. In the interest of time, ladies, would you share anything else or have anything to add to this question regarding certification and additional credentials that we haven't discussed? And I'll turn it over to Rita first. I think once again, anything you can do to put yourself above the competition is good. If you're looking for a job that has a certification, do it. Look at Career Source Palm Beach County. They may be able to pay for it. Look at the massive open online courses. Absolutely. Look at credentials. It gives you one check mark above your competition. Absolutely. And it helps anybody, mature workers, anybody. Yes. I agree with that. And especially those certifications that require renewed, uh, renewing or um, recertifying and having to get education in order to keep it up. That just shows that you're staying on top of your, your field of your industry. So I think that helps a lot too. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, this question gets to the aspect of a company who really values or an organization that truly values its employees. Um, and how would one go about prior to perhaps interviewing to learn a bit about an organization's culture, particularly if you don't know anybody that works at that company? What might you recommend? And we'll start with Rita Craig. I would say one thing is look at their website. Uh, I mentioned a little while ago that some have social responsibility sections on there. I think more and more organizations are sh starting to show what it's like to work at an organization. I think another thing is you can look at Glassdoor, but a lot of times it's, you know, people are putting negative things, not necessarily all positive, but you, look, you can look at that and then try to join associations and um, network with individuals who might so know somebody who works there. And uh, be real about the kinds of questions you're asking. You know, when you talk about culture, it's about systems, about what's rewarded, it's about strategy, it's about style. Um, so be deliberate about the kinds of questions you're asking and make sure that there's a fit. So I think it's really important to find out about the culture. Uh, there have been many stories, obviously, over the years about Southwest very much having a culture that's people-centric and um, people who've gotten employed who crashed and burned because they really didn't want to talk to people and didn't have that same personality. So 
every business has a rhythm and a culture and it, you're, it behooves you to make sure you understand up front, is it a, a, an intense environment? Is it a fun family oriented environment? What is it so that you can make sure that, that there's a match, but just find people who know people. Mm -hmm. Thank I, you, Paula. Yeah, I agree with that. I won't say much more. Um, I would say utilize um, LinkedIn. Um, when you, the feature in LinkedIn that shows who your connections know, and then from there, maybe asking them, hey, how do you know such and such? I see that they work at whatever company that I'm trying to get into. Um, can you facilitate an introduction? And a lot of the times it's you have not because you ask not. Mm -hmm. You'll be surprised what people will do to help you just if you ask, but that's a great resource to network with people, especially virtually LinkedIn. I want to add one thing, um, Karen, and I've, I've been saying this to all my clients recently is I think how companies have managed this huge crisis we're in is going to end up being an interview question. Mm. You know, how, what, what did you do? Describe what kinds of things you did in place to um, manage through the crisis, you know, and I, there, there are already a lot of examples of companies who are really doing great things and they're showing the soul of the business. Conversely, I have heard lots of horror stories from people who the companies are not being, um, they're not adhering to many safety issues at all. And employees are, are very, getting very upset about that. So this is a test too. I mean, you never know when this kind of experience is gonna end up being a, um, a real make it or break it kind of interview question. Well, thank you. That's very intriguing. I had not thought about that. So you're right. That's a good way to see perhaps how the company responds, like you said, in a crisis and how it treats its employees. It's easy to treat people when everything's going wonderfully, <laughs> but when the chips are down, that really tells something. So thank you. We had a question uh, from a retired MD who wants to use their considerable health knowledge in a position where they can work from home. Do you have any suggestions? I did see something in the chat box earlier where I believe somebody indicated they were hiring for some positions. I don't know whether um, it was a home position or not working from home, but ladies, would you have anything to share uh, for a retired MD? And we'll start with Paula. Um, I have seen a lot of positions. I mean, I can't speak towards one company or another, but as far as um, at home and um, utilizing the MD background, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, what you call it, insurance companies. I would, I would just look, I I'll just send you in a general direction. I would check um, insurance companies. I would check with um, healthcare recruiters. A lot of the time they have an inside um, track into what organizations want. Um, Headhunters, um, there are some that are spe specified to healthcare. If you wanna connect after, I can probably give you some, some more like, specific information like names. Um, I'll put my, my email address in the chat and I can probably give you a little bit more specialized um, information, but I would need to do a little bit of research. We'll be posting that also, Paula. Oh, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. Okay, All right. thank you. Rita, anything you'd like to add in our closing moments to perhaps even just broaden it a bit to folks who might want to work from home in general, you know, in terms of not um, just the virtual work that they perhaps uh, want to get a bit involved in that? Yeah, I, I reached out to Career Source. I, I, I've been associated with them probably 30 years now, and um, I noticed I can't screen share. And if you can dislodge that, I can show you a handout. But if not, they have about 400 and uh, just under 450 jobs listed right now that are open. So I would go to careersourcepbc.com. You can search by critical words, healthcare, whatever. You can also search by a certain uh, mile radius that uh, you're interested in and that'll pull up the jobs that are available and it'll pull up the kinds of qualifications that they're looking for. So um, I would use that. It's, it's funded through taxpayers. So the services are no cost, whether it's interviewing skills, whether it's how to, how to interview remotely, whether it's how to develop your resume, 
all that is available and the search engine spiders out to a multitude of search engines. So it's, you know, monster and all of those. So I would definitely do a word search on careersourcepbc.com and see if, um, see if you can find something there. Wonderful. Well, I um, don't know how to put one of those clapping hands yet on Zoom. I'm one of those curious people who haven't gotten that far yet in learning. Um, Rita, there it is. Paula has it up. But I'd like to uh, have all of us clap for you in the <laughs> privacy of their home or the clapping hands or waving and thank you ladies <laughs> you did fantastic we so appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today i'm going to mute myself now and turn it back over to christine who will wrap us up and then cover the items on our slides here so thank you ladies uh, very much and christine take it away Thank you very much. I haven't found the button here. I could see I need a lot to learn about Zoom. Uh, but I will read just a couple of quick things. Um, one of them is a question about technical skills. What technical skills do you recommend training for in this new world of work? And uh, Paula, we'll start with you. Um, like we mentioned before, Zoom. Um, I, I think this is, this is not just a COVID-19 trend that we're on. Um, social, you know, uh, sorry, communicating this way. So I would definitely be familiar with um, any type of platform like this because they're kind of similar. If you notice, Zoom, Teams, um, Go Meet. I, I've I've had so many meeting requests. So just be familiar with with those and and also. Um, do a little bit of marketing yourself, social media wise, because nowadays, in addition to your resume, some people will go straight to your social media profile and, and check you out. And if there's nothing to be seen, then mm, they may or may not go to the next step. Thank you, Rita. I go to the company website that you're looking for as well and look at the social media that they're using, go to their sites, make sure you learn that monitor it, comment on it, whether it's LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, those kinds of things. So get noticed there. And that way in the interview, you can say that you actually have participated and been active on some of their sites. Uh, and then if there's a specific technology that's required for the job, then um, seek people out and learn it. I mean, if you, if you can afford it, if you can't, you might be able to find a free source that, that would um, cover those costs. Great, thank you. And uh, we have Nicole from Palm Beach State College uh, put a post that the CCE department is offering free online courses. Registration is open until June. Thank you, Nicole. And okay, and we also have, if anyone's interested in a part-time associate uh, position with medical billing and home care experience for 25 hours a week, Dr. Cassidy. So just um, stay on and we'll get that information to you at the end. And um, just to wrap up, I want to thank you, you all very much, ladies. This was great information. And um, just to share a little bit about Encore, um, we are doing these events weekly and trying to get the most up-to-date information that we can share. And um, so we do have an, actually a Zoom event coming up next week with Sheila Finkelstein. Sheila does technology for seniors. So um, she's a great place to start if you really are in help of any kind of technology. And I guess I'm gonna start taking her classes too. I have so much to learn. And, uh, and we did have a question, Rita, also about when you will be offering your um, Zoom programs, your Zoom trainings. <laughs> I've done, uh, I've done multitude of those uh, in the community, just showing people how to use it. I've, again, I've used it for four years. So um, let me just tell you some of the things you can do. I don't have any scheduled now, but uh, you know, I might be doing one in the near future. But you can uh, obviously do programs. You can record them like this one's recorded. You mm -hmm. can do polls online. I can hit a button and, and take everybody in this session and put you into two different rooms with a whiteboard where you can take notes, either writing it on the board or typing it on the board. Um, so there's a lot of, it's just like a virtual training workshop. It's really great. So 
if you want to learn Zoom and you have a sense of urgency right now, go to the Zoom website. I happen to have an account. If you don't, you can speak for 45 minutes for no cost. Get a buddy and look, go online. They have videos on how to do everything. They're so easy to look at. And the best way to learn is to learn by using the tool. So mm -hmm. just get a business partner. I don't have anything again right now scheduled. Like I said, if I do in the future, I'll let you know. But um, that's what I would do. Be on the bandwagon. Everybody's using Zoom, Blue Jeans, um, uh, WebEx, Microsoft Teams. These are the ones that are real common. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. I am putting Dr. Cassidy's information in the chat if you are interested in that position. And um, on EncorePBC.org, we have a number of resources to help people find work and refer, we refer people to them. And we are an advocate for mature workers, so we want to recognize employers who are age friendly as well. And we have our Wisdom and Experience Works for Business Awards event scheduled for October 30th. It's been um, uh, rescheduled because of the pandemic. And um, this will definitely have an impact, the pandemic will, on older workers. So we will be uh, creating a number of online messages and events in the upcoming weeks to help people looking for work or who would like to be volunteers, which is part of our mission. Again, I thank you all. Then I am going to pop up the next slide with the contact information for the ladies. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Before we go, Paula, I put a, um, Paula's uh, area code is 561. So for Paula Humber, everybody, 561-618-7408, and Rita Craig, 561-775-3396. So please, uh, these ladies are fantastic, and um, keep their numbers, keep their web uh, addresses, their emails, and one final thank you to all participants and all of our uh, experts, our ladies. And Christine, thank you for, to you very much for setting this up. Is My there pleasure. any last items for the good of the order? I think we're good to go. Oh, wait, wait, there's something in the chat. Hold on, let's see. Oh, Holly, thank you, Holly. Fantastic information. She's thanking Rita and Paula. And I think we are good to go, ladies. Thank you again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.